Good evening and uh, welcome to the Dan Flavin installation at the Manil Collection. Uh, my name is Paul Davis. I'm the curator of collections at the Manil Collection. And I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's uh, seminar or symposium, uh, the Vivian Neal Smith Foundation Symposium. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to kindly request if everybody could just uh, silence their phones or make sure they're silenced, please. And I'd also like to take a moment to thank the museum staff, uh, particularly Tony Martinez, Jeremy Falk, and Ted Bale for their support of this year's fellow and for the organization of today's uh, symposium. Your help has been instrumental to getting this uh, evening off the ground. And so, a vibrant open space for the exhibition of innovative artists, the Manila Collection is equally, and importantly so, a center for critical study of and the reflection about art and its disparate histories. As Dominique de Manil contended, these are two inseparable facets of the museum's mission. Since 2007, the Vivian L. Smith Foundation has generously supported this, this imperative by funding an academic year fellowship for outstanding doctoral candidates in the Department of Art History at the University of uh, Texas, Austin. And I'd like to take a moment to thank Professor Richard Schiff and the art history faculty at the University of Texas Austin for their 11 years of partnership in making this fellowship a, such a significant success. The Vivian L. Smith Foundation provides fellows with a truly exceptional opportunity to, to work full time on completing their dissertations while, while in residence at the Middle Collection. Here, fellows work closely with the museum staff to engage the Manil's internationally recognized permanent collection. Fellows also contribute to the museum's programming for its members and general public. The enduring scholarly impact of the Vivian L. Smith Fellowship at the Manil is resoundingly clear. Previous fellows have moved on to become professors and curators at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, the William Benton Museum of Art, and the University of Texas El Paso. And I'd just like to spend a moment, just a second, to recognize some recent advancements in uh, former fellows. Claire Howard, who is in the audience with us tonight, the, the last year's fellow, was, a, was recently appointed assistant curator of modern contemporary art at the Blanton Museum of Art. Ka Catherine Ananya, uh, the 2015-16 fellow, is, is currently the Wallace Fellow at, the Harvard, at Harvard University. Roja Najafi, 2013 to 2014, was most recently appointed curator at Oklahoma City Museum of Art. And Caitlin Haskell, who is a 2010 and 2011 fellow, was, was appointed curator of international modern art at the Arts Institute of Chicago. And so, before introducing this year's Vivian L. Smith Fellow, I have the immense pleasure to announce that the fellow for 2018-2019 will be Douglas Cushing whose doctoral research focuses on the Surrealist Journal Transitions. Congratulations, Douglas. And, and, and now on to Jessamine. So over the past year, I have thoroughly enjoyed working with Jessamine Batario, the current Vivian L. Smith fellow, fellow. Her pursuit of simultaneously drawing from multiple art, art historical threads has been exceptionally thought-provoking and inspiring. Before coming to the Manil, she received the, the Dayless Foundation Dissertation Fellowship. Her dissertation promises to be a nuanced, close reading of key 20th century art historical texts, artistic practices, ideological positions, and their conceptual slippages that came to define and legitimize Western modernism. She has organized this evening's program around central questions from her doctoral studies at UT Austin. During her residence at the Manil, Jessamine gave multiple presentations to Manil staff, as well as gallery talks to the museum's members. She also completed a peer-reviewed article examining the intellectual shifts in Clement Greenberg's lesser known 1958 essay, Byzantine Parallels. This article will be published this June in the Journal of Art Historiography. So thank you, Jessmine, for tonight. And thank you, the speakers, uh, for the, the presentations to come. I'm looking forward to this evening's discussions. And now, Jessmine. <laughs> 
Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, before I begin, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Vivian L. Smith Foundation for its continued support of early career art historians at the University of Texas at Austin. I would also like to thank some individuals at the Manil Collection, without whose assistance and collegiality I could not have conducted my research, developed my ideas, or organized this symposium. They are Paul Davis, Lauren Gottlieb Miller, Tony Martinez, Joseph Newland, Sarah Robinson, Margaret McKee, Anthony Flores, and Elsian Cousins. This symposium considers two senses of the word transgression, its physical sense and its conceptual sense. How does physical transgression, in other words, crossing boundaries and stepping from here to there, shift into the territory of conceptual transgression or breaking rules and violating moral codes? There are many ways to think of both types of transgression in terms of space, as current events ask us to consider walls and those who would cross them. As the title of the symposium suggests, Tonight we orient our attention to things that transgress not only the borders of space, but also the borders of historical time. On a lighter note, at least for the moment, I am of course talking about time travel. We might be inclined to associate time travel with fictional accounts, such as Owen Wilson's character transported to the Parisian 1920s of Gertrude Stein, Pablo Picasso, and Salvador Dali, for example. Or Michael J. Fox engaged in a hoverboard chase in the distant future of 2015. However, I propose that we might think of artworks as time travelers. As material objects and visual forms, artworks survive from the time of their making through periods in history to the here and now. Throughout this physical transgression across historical periods, artworks accumulate different meanings from those who use and interpret them. Some interpretations might vary radically from the original context of the artwork's creation, appearing to violate the rules of history and thus becoming conceptual transgressions. With the acknowledgement that forms persist over time, that meanings accumulate and potentially change, we might ask ourselves about the role of the art historian in this landscape of shifting interpretations. According to Georges Didi Huberman, a French philosopher and notably a fellow art historian, quote, historians in general prefer not to risk being wrong so they embrace the idea of facts and condescend to speculation. We might call their attitude scientific modesty or cowardice or philosophical laziness." End quote. To some degree, these fighting words encapsulate our theme tonight. Transgression involves risk and it involves being wrong. The Manil Collection has a history of engaging in risk of embracing what one of our speakers tonight, Amy Knight Powell, calls the promiscuity of images. The Manil Collection has a record of putting things seemingly out of proper time. In 2013, Byzantine Things in the World recontextualized Byzantine Things by exhibiting them alongside art of the modern and contemporary periods. This show asked us to consider the presence of these materials relative to one another and relative to ourselves as we transgressed the gallery space. 60 years ago, in 1958, Germaine McKaigie, the De Manil's first curator, staged Islands Beyond, an exhibition at the University of St. Thomas that likewise juxtaposed modern works with medieval ones. Whether old or new, the paintings and sculptures were meant to serve as conduits to a reality beyond their material existence generating new meanings through recontextualization in their present time. If we go further back in time, as the art historian Richard Meyer has done, we might consider Alfred Barr's exhibition practice during the 1930s and 1940s as the first director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Although installed on different floors of MoMA, exhibitions of prehistoric imagery and of Italian Renaissance paintings suggested formal connections to the 20th century works elsewhere in the museum. Barr's bridging of old and new incited external criticism and internal resistance. <laughs> 
American artists begrudged Barr the Italian Masters show in particular, a sentiment underscored by MoMA's own advisory committee's decision to censure Barr for the exhibition. With his, with his typical cheekiness, the artist Ad Reinhardt circulated a flyer during a protest of MoMA's exhibitions in 1940. How modern is the museum of modern art? Note how the M in the second modern evokes medieval manuscript illumination. To point out the absurdity of the Italian masters show for this venue, a museum that professes to show art in our time, Reinhardt facetiously suggests that MoMA is now free to exhibit ancient Greek and Egyptian sculpture and 18th century Japanese woodblock prints. Quote, how easy to justify a Praxiteles show, how revolutionary the Egyptians and an 18th century Japanese. Why not build pyramids? Why not tear down the museum and build a pyramid? End quote. And though the sarcasm was likely meant as a rebuke to Barr's exhibition strategies, Barr himself might have conceded that yes, he did indeed want to show such things at the Museum of Modern Art. In 1931, Barr was in the planning stage of a large-scale exhibition called Modern Art, Past and Present, an ambitious show that would have exhibited modern works alongside those from other historical periods, all in the same gallery space. The categories on Barr's wish list of non-modern items included ancient Egypt, pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, 16th century Europe, and Tang China, to name a few. Whether for logistical, financial, or critical reasons, the exhibition never came to fruition. Why might this recontextualization, this risky time travel, as well as geographic travel, feel wrong? How did physical transgression become conceptual transgression? One answer lies in the, dis the specific discourse of the West's fraught relationship to cultures it deemed, quote, primitive, something I have been thinking about as modernism's tendency to colonize all the time. This relationship is inherently tied to differing conceptions of time, a topic that Dr. Keith Moxie will touch upon. I would like to posit some general thoughts on these questions by considering admittedly Western modes of art historical thinking, ideas developed during an experience I had in front of Crucifixion and Reflection, a painting by Robert Rauschenberg here at the Manil Collection. By chance, a colleague mentioned the differences between horizontal and vertical history on the morning I encountered this Rauschenberg painting that consists of horizontal and vertical elements. A vertical art history considers the succession of styles over time, for example, Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, Fauvism, Cubism, Surrealism, Abstract Expressionism. Alfred Barr is notorious for this type of vertical diagramming. In art history, these isms not only categorize artworks and artists, but also the people who study them. I might be a modernist, or I might be a medievalist. This localization of temporal expertise gives rise to the converse mode of interpreting art the horizontal way. In other words, vertical art history makes possible horizontal art history, a view that holds that the study of art should entail the understanding of the work in its original environment, considering it against the backdrop of simultaneous events in history, politics, literature, music, and so on. MoMA updated Barr's diagram of abstract art in 2012, remedying the generalization of isms by naming names and showing horizontal connections between artists and musicians, such as Claude Debussy, and between artists and writers, such as Guillaume Apollinaire. Horizontal art history takes as its mantra the now-hardened orthodoxy that art was not created in a vacuum. If we want to be reductive, we might say that vertical art history is concerned with forms over time, while horizontal art history is concerned with context in shared space. Horizontal and interdisciplinary art history seem to be the norm now, to the point that vertical considerations of transgressive forms might feel like a risk. <laughs> 
but a few decades ago, horizontal art history was considered a transgression by strict formalists. In geology, after all, transgression means a spreading over an area of land, a horizontality. I was vexed, both by the earlier conversation about these distinctions and by the painting before me. The horizontal and vertical lines of the painting are misaligned, as if to tell me that there is something misleading about the distinction between horizontal and vertical interpretations of art. Visualized on spatial terms, the horizontal-vertical distinction presumes that history is flat. Historical time in this conception is linear, plotted on one point to another along the vertical axis. But even the flat Rauschenberg has depth, perceived in the duration it took me to walk to its side in the gallery. As I stepped forward, away from, and around the Rauschenberg, I was reminded of Jeanette Christensen's Horizontal Vertical, an installation of two ladders made of jello lying on a bed of marble chips on the floor, verticals rendered horizontally. To my fellow modernists in the room, it is not lost on me that Leo Steinberg famously credited Rauschenberg with the postmodern shift from upright vertical orientation to the infamous horizontal flatbed picture plane. I began to feel guilty that my mind was wandering to all things horizontal and vertical when crucifixion and reflection likely has nothing to do with horizontal and vertical art history. However, I recalled how Rauschenberg erased de Kooning's drawing with permission. I also remember that Rauschenberg painted crucifixion and reflection one year before his white paintings, about which his friend John Cage wrote that a viewer ought to, quote, deal with your freedom just as the artist dealt with his, not in the same way, but nevertheless originally, end quote. This historical rationalization encouraged me to risk being wrong, and I thought to myself that perhaps Rauschenberg might forgive my transgression. In any case, the afterimage of Christensen's installation flashed in my mind's eye as I looked at the Rauschenberg. It shocked me in the same way that a cockroach scurrying across my kitchen floor, and I want to be clear that the cockroach was in my kitchen and not in the gallery, a cockroach shocked me on the night before I thought of Rauschenberg and Christensen. With the memory of the cockroach transgressing my kitchen and transgressing my mind, I became aware that this installation view of Christensen's work gives the vantage point of a standing human looking down at the ladders. But what might a cockroach see? Or an ant, if you prefer, because Texas cockroaches are quite large. To a puny insect activating longitudinal and peripheral vision at the face of Christensen's ladder, the vertical made horizontal might be as vertical as it is horizontal. Depending on where we stand, a three-dimensional object might appear flat. Scale and orientation matter in seeing as in thinking. An art history that deals with time-traveling art reveals plainly the arbitrating hand of the art historian as interpretant. In order to engage in this method, an art historian acknowledges, implicitly or explicitly, her privileged position in the present. Seeing oneself as the insect in front of a ladder can be unnerving, as uncomfortable as it might feel to confront an oversized rotary food mill, a feeling incited by the Terra Infirma exhibition of Mona Hatoum's works held here recently. History to a historian is a sugar ladder to an insect, the view might be flat from where we stand, but we are actually confronting a multidimensional accumulation of history, what the critical theorist Walter Benjamin calls a pile of debris. We are used to seeing reproductions of works of art as free-floating images, and not with ourselves in the frame. Context matters, including the context within which we look at and think about art in the present. The striking connections made by each speaker tonight, whether between an ancient fresco and a 20th century Mondrian, 
a medieval form in a present appropriation, or a Northern European altarpiece in a Chinese landscape, give rise to a feeling of great historical scale that might only be felt from our present position and orientation. I'm very pleased to welcome each of these scholars whose ways of thinking have informed, sharpened, and inspired my own. I will introduce each of them at once and ask that you save your questions for the end of tonight's program. Our next speaker is Dr. Karen Overby, an associate professor of art history at Tufts University, the author of Sacral Geographies and the co-founder of Material Collective, a collaborative group of scholars dedicated to interdisciplinarity, experimental scholarship, and activism. While the group consists of mostly medievalists, I'm happy to confirm that they do welcome wayward modernists. Dr. Overby will present a long history of a particular form. Dr. Overby's paper on the appropriation of medieval imagery by white supremacists is oriented through an understanding and a criticism of art's accumulating receptions. And finally, Dr. Keith Moxie is a professor emeritus from Barnard College, Columbia University, where he was previously the Barbara Novak Professor of Art History. In addition to several books on art historiography as well as on Northern European paintings and prints, Dr. Moxie wrote a book on art's relationship to time called Visual Time, The Image in History. His paper tonight compares two 15th century paintings, a Van Eyck altarpiece and a Shenzhou landscape, in order to present two different modes of temporal understanding that ultimately ask us to consider art history's present potential. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Jessamyn, for this uh, opportunity. Last summer, in Charlottesville, Virginia, protesters gathered to call for the removal of the statue of Robert E. Lee from Emancipation Park. Far right-wing groups, neo-Nazis, Klansmen, and several militias, many carrying torches or rifles, shouting racist and anti-Semitic slogans, rallied in a counter-protest in hopes of uniting the white nationalist movement in America. The images that emerged from the Charlottesville riot were a catalyst for many medievalists across the country, especially for scholars of medieval Britain, Ireland, and Scandinavia. Because in addition to Confederate flags, the white supremacists carried shields and banners with runes, Celtic crosses, and Viking eagles. <coughs> this isn't a new development. Medieval imagery, especially warriors and knights, has long been used in right-wing political discourse. You may know Herbert Lanzinger's 1935 painting, The Standard Bearer, which depicts Adolf Hitler as a medieval knight, clad in shining armor with a Nazi flag billowing behind him. Or, more recently, you may have seen images of Marine Le Pen, the far-right leader of France's National Front Party, with a statue of Joan of Arc. The National Front adopted the 15th century saint as their icon about 20 years ago, and Le Pen frequently uses the image as a backdrop for her campaign speeches. In the US, in the last 10 years, but especially in the last two or three, far right-wing groups are increasingly seizing on medieval references to express racist and anti-immigrant sentiments. This is a disturbing visual discourse that goes far beyond the pulp memes of the 90s, along with the, which along with the crusader rhetoric employed by both Presidents Bush about the war in the Middle East, reduced the Middle Ages to a signifier for brutality in the minds of a generation. After Charlottesville, we began to ask, what are white supremacists doing with our art? How and why is medieval imagery being adopted by hate groups and weaponized by white nationalists? To address these questions, which have become central and urgent in my field, I'm drawing on current ongoing work in the medievalist academic community, including Facebook discussions, blog posts, podcasts, workshops, and conference panels. Fighting white supremacists with medieval studies has become a central project, unexpected, not just for art historians, but for literary scholars, historians, and archeologists. This issue raises questions of historiography, pedagogy, and the public role of academics, 
questions I'll touch on briefly tonight, but it also asks us to examine our own desires as historians, what we look for and what we expect to find in the past, and what responsibility art historians have to frame our work in terms of ethics. I want to stress that what I'm sharing with you tonight isn't what you'd call typical art historical research. On the one hand, it's largely unoriginal. I'm repeating and amplifying the work of my colleagues because this is material that needs to be shared often and widely. Also, there's no discovery, no big reveal. This is an ongoing project, part of a public conversation happening in social media, in classrooms, and in communities with the goal of open dialogue to create change within our field and around it. This is a project of art historical activism and a call to examine scholarly praxis. I begin with a familiar example, the so-called Celtic cross. It is, as Maggie Williams, my co-founder in the Material Collective has written, an icon of Irishness. This cross form has origins in early Christian Ireland as a marker of pilgrimage and sacred sites, and was most frequently used in monasteries in the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries to cement alliances, commemorate patronage, and express historical claims to territory. In the 19th century, in the charged political context of the move toward Irish independence, the monuments of early Ireland were presented to the public through events like the Dublin Great Exhibition of 1853, where plaster casts of the crosses and a few originals were displayed. The exhibition intended to promote a modern image of Ireland and to encourage new manufacturing and commerce. Ireland's past was represented too. There were Bronze Age armlets, late medieval harps, small pieces of jewelry that were labeled druid beads, Manuscript, uh, medieval manuscripts and reliquaries, and 12th century sculpture, all on display in the exhibition. Most of the medieval objects were given quite early dates, which placed them before English colonization, whether or not that was actually the case, and identified them as authentically and purely Irish. This drawing from the art journal's illustrated catalog of the exhibition suggests that the objects were arranged without distinction of period or function and as collective evidence of the cultural achievements of the past, a seamless and homogenous native tradition. In this context, motifs from medieval Irish art, especially geometric interlace and the image of the Irish ringed cross were promoted as Celtic an invented designation meant to convey a timeless, essential Irish identity. Many scholars have traced the politics of the Celtic revival and demonstrated the links between cultural nostalgia and political nationalism, and in particular, the invention of Celtic as an ethnic or even racial identity. So that's not my project here. My goal instead is to suggest the mechanisms by which objects slip from their medieval histories to become symbols, in this case, a symbol of Irish nationalism and identity. In a forthcoming essay, Williams lays out the context for the further transformation of the so-called Celtic cross to an image of Irish American identity and eventually to an unlikely symbol of violent ideology. In Ireland, the Celtic revival was an anti-imperialist and pro-Catholic movement. But as Williams writes, it transformed into something quite different in the Irish diaspora. Many Irish Catholic immigrants arrived in America in the mid to late 19th century, having escaped brutal conditions of oppression and famine at home. They struggled to find their way in a new place, and they were thrown into competition with other ethnic groups, many equally desperate for work and social stability. Williams notes incidents of Irish immigrants attacking other immigrants and attacking black people, including women and children. The hardships of immigrant life contributed to the formation of many of the racist attitudes among white working class European Americans, attitudes we still contend with today. This is the context in which the so-called Celtic cross, already reconfigured as a nationalist icon in Ireland, became firmly associated with Irish American identity, which was itself often equated with a generalized notion of whiteness. Modern white nationalists have made use of several versions of a stylized ringed cross, 
often to symbolize just such a timeless white Christian culture. A 2010 post to the white nationalist website Stormfront, which William cites, explains, because we can't use the swastika is why we use the Celtic cross. It symbolizes Christendom and Christianity, and also the white pre-Christian tribes in Europe. This is, or at least it should be, chilling. The Celtic cross stands in for the swastika as a more covert sign, a neo-Nazi dog whistle. For white supremacists, medieval Europe is a fantasy of white culture and the source of an imagined pure heritage. As Paul Sturdevant wrote on the blog, the, medieval, the Public Medievalist in February of 2017, quote, right-wing white supremacists, both in Europe and in the US, have held a special place in their hearts for the Middle Ages, since at least the beginning of the 19th century. Unfortunately, this view has trickled into the groundwater of the broader historical consciousness, end quote. This is a dangerous view of a whites-only Middle Ages, a Middle Ages located primarily in England, Ireland, and Western Europe, with fair-skinned royals and valiant knights defending the borders against threats to that homogeneity. It's a Middle Ages familiar to us from fantasy novels, from video games, from movies and television, even if our own often privileged positions have kept us from recognizing how partial and inaccurate it is. It's not only Celtic imagery that's marshaled in defense of the whites only Middle Ages. Crusader imagery is popular, both in the US and in Europe, as seen here in an image of Czech demonstrators at an anti-refugee rally in 2015. The woman on the right holds a shield reading, Stop Islamu, or Stop Islamization, and Vivat Krak de Chevalier, a reference to the 12th century crusader castle in western Syria that has been badly damaged during the Civil War. The graffiti on the Scottish mosque, Deus Volt, or God Wills It, is recorded in 12th century texts as a battle cry of Christian crusaders in the Holy Land. And the meme in the upper right was circulated online beginning in January 2017, following President Trump's executive order of the first travel ban. Identity Europa, a white nationalist anti-immigrant group with chapters across the US, distributes flyers on high school and college campuses with imagery of white marble classical and Renaissance sculptures that make their propaganda posters look like flyers for art history courses. According to their website, a central point in Identity Europa's message is that white people should take pride in their race and resist being ethnically cleansed. Another source for the white nationalist imagination is Viking imagery, which has a long history in Nazi propaganda. The World War II recru recruitment poster on the left, for example, calls on the Norse Legion to join with the armed wing of the SS against the Bolsheviks. On the right is a flyer for a political convention in Nazi-occupied Norway that aligns modern Nazi soldiers with medieval Vikings. In contemporary white supremacist use, Viking motifs project a similar sense of white identity and heritage as the appropriations of Celtic art, often with more violent or martial undertones, using Thor's hammers, ravens, and runes. The tattoos that are shown here are all um, posted to um, white supremacist blogs and websites as images, as examples of covert imagery that can express white superiority. Some of the white supremacists marching in Charlottesville last summer carried banners with the Othala rune, which is found in early Scandinavian inscriptions and in 9th century poetry in Anglo-Saxon England. In the poetry, Othala expresses the idea of homeland or inheritance, and white nationalists display this as a symbol of their claims to historical continuity of identity, as well as a threat to others that they see as taking land that's rightly theirs. Versions of the Othala rune have been used by several Nazi and neo-Nazi groups in Germany, South Africa, and the US since the mid-20th century. And in 2016, the National Socialist Movement, an American neo-Nazi political party, replaced the swastika on their regalia with the Othala. Like swapping the swastika for the Celtic cross, this is meant to provide cover to operate in the mainstream. <clears throat> 
Marchers in Charlottesville also carried medieval style shields, including this black eagle shield, which is sold on eBay as a replica Viking weapon. But this is faulty medievalism. It's not a Viking style shield. The form is wrong, the imagery is wrong. No Viking shields are known to have been painted with birds or with other iconography, despite the connection of the Norse god Odin with ravens. And there's more that's wrong here. As the activist and art historian known on social media as Medieval POC has made clear, the shield is actually that of the Roman Theban Legion and is primarily associated with Saint Maurice, a, an Egyptian Christian soldier who lived in, uh, who served in the Roman army in the third century and who's been depicted as black since at least the 12th. Of course, there were people of color in medieval Europe. We have lots of visual, archeological, and textual evidence to refute bad medievalism and claims of pure whiteness or racial isolationism. The Viking Age Norse and Swedes, for example, had frequent and peaceable relations with Muslim traders, and they displayed Islamic coins on their jewelry as signs of wealth, taste, and worldliness. And it doesn't take a medievalist to know that David, here in Michelangelo's sculpture, reproduced on an Identity Europa poster, was a Middle Eastern Jew. Calling out the ironic historical inaccuracies of white supremacist dangerous ideological misappropriation of the Middle Ages is not, however, an end goal in itself. These incidents and so many more, which have been made visible through social media, podcasts, and blogs, have been a call to action for historians of antiquity in the Middle Ages, making clear that we need to reshape our view of the past in order to reshape the public's view. This is imperative not only because it's the medieval history we should be teaching and researching and exhibiting, but because young neo-Nazis and white supremacists are taking our classes. Nathan D'Amigo, the founder of Identity Europa, is a student at a Cal State campus. One of the Charlottesville tiki torch wielding aggressors was a student at the University of Nevada, Reno, taking medieval history courses and according to his classmates, often making racist comments. If we are inadvertently or through habit presenting in classes and textbooks and museum displays a mostly or unproblematically white Middle Ages, a Middle Ages that's Christian by default, or a Eurocentric Middle Ages, we must do better. As my Material Collective colleague Asa Mittman recently pointed out in a podcast interview, we've provided a space where these narratives could thrive if we did not directly challenge them. This is a tough challenge to take up, in part because the concept of the Middle Ages itself is premised on the chronological development of a geographically bounded Western Europe. In the art history textbook I used as an undergraduate, the chapters on medieval art covered only France, England, Germany, and Italy. They were followed by non-European art a 100-page section on India, China, Japan, Africa, the Americas, and the South Pacific from 3000 BC to the 20th century. While we could talk about that framework for the rest of the weekend, what I want to stress here is, <laughs> yeah, is the separation of medieval Western Europe from the rest of the world, a separation that generations of students internalized and that's in, as inaccurate and distorted as it is tenacious in the public imagination. As Marianne O'Doherty writes in another blog on the public medievalist site, quote, when medieval people viewed their world, they envisaged it as stretching from the land of darkness, as Marco Polo calls it, of Northern Asia, to Madagascar and Sumatra in the south, and as far east as Japan. O'Doherty continues, our horizons, when we think about the Middle Ages, need to stretch across these distances and cultures too. Europe was not the center of the world in the medieval period. We have made it so. From long before Charlottesville, many medieval art historians have turned their focus to sites of cultural exchange, such as medieval Sicily in Spain, to the movement of materials and resources across, across global trade routes, and to the reuses and multiple, often contradictory, receptions of artworks. <laughs> 
All of these are strategies that can subvert notions of purity. Such work can disrupt the narratives that center France, England, and Germany, and that further reify borders and identities that were, in the Middle Ages, fluid and often contentious. In my own research on jewelry and metalwork in early medieval uh, England, Ireland, and Scandinavia, I've looked at the circulation and reuse of materials, including gemstones. The garnets in 7th century Anglo-Saxon Anglo metalwork, for example, were mined in India, Sri Lanka, and the Czech Republic. They were imported through the Frankish Kingdom, which maintained trade partnerships with the Byzantine Empire, who in turn sourced goods from Silk Road merchants. I was surprised to learn the extent of trade networks and travel routes, especially in relation to my current research on Kentish disc brooches, which you see an example here. The white material on a number of examples, usually assumed to be ivory or bone, is in fact shell. Specifically, the shells of large marine gastropods like conch, abalone, and large whelks, species that biologists have shown were too large to have grown in the cool waters around Britain. These were imports from the Red Sea, from the Indo-Pacific, and from the Mediterranean, passing through the hands of traders to end up as decorative material in the jewelry of elite Anglo-Saxon women. And sometimes they ended up whole as valuable objects themselves. Cowrie shells have been found in 7th century women's graves, alongside other personal items and heirlooms. Although there are no texts specifically describing attitudes to these oceanic treasures, the Anglo-Saxons did write extensively about the sea and about sea travel. The presence of these shells can help us to understand some of the ways that early medieval people saw their world as reaching further than their own shores. Now, my study of jewelry materials isn't going to make Anglo-Saxon England less white. But I hope it will, in some small way, reveal it to be less inward-focused, less tribal. And in any case, recounting, uh, um, reorienting my own inquiries, considering the materiality of medieval objects in relation to global trade, seafaring economies, and the reception of materials, has prompted me to reflect on art historical desire. What questions do we ask? What do we want when we look at objects? Are we looking for reflections of ourselves? I think we must have been for a very long time, given the state of things. It, that isn't inherently a bad thing, except that art history has been primarily a white discipline for a long time, and medieval studies and medieval art history are even whiter. It's been easy for us in our contentedly ignorant privilege to continue to center that whiteness and to make it truly difficult for anyone else to see themselves in the Middle Ages. This is exactly the kind of entrenched history that collectives like medievalists of color are working to dismantle. What then should be our responsibility? As the Byzantinist Roland Betancourt has recently written, quote, if art historians believe that their work has any meaning or function outside of the academy, then they are implicitly acknowledging that their work has ethical consequences. This can be, as Betancourt suggests, quote, as simple as constructing interpretations of the past for communities which set the foundations for their presence and potential futures. When we imagine the past, we have, I believe, an ethical imperative to expand our field of vision, to redress the 19th century imperialist perspective of homogeneity and rightful dominance, a view that claims ancestral heritage in medieval Europe. So I show you two images of um, websites and Twitter accounts um, by medievalists of color who are actively working against these colonialist and imperialist paradigms. Whether or not we are medievalists or art historians or none of the above, we can work toward this. We can, as Betancourt urges, make ethics a methodological imperative. Thank you for listening. Onward.
Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to Jessamine once again. And um, it's wonderful to be back in Houston once again, and uh, particularly at this um, very thoughtful meeting that's been uh, arranged for this evening. Uh, some of the themes that I want to touch upon have already been mentioned, the Eurocentrism, Eurocentrism of art history, for example, and um, its um, ideas of history. And it's really about a history, uh, what we call history, what, is, what passes for history, art history, in uh, Europe and the United States that um, has been exported across the world uh, and uh, various and sundry civilizations and cultures have been interpreted according to a schedule of time, an organization of time that owes its origins to the late 19th century and is basically European in nature. So um, let me begin by trying to summarize what I want to say here. I want to look at two paintings, one of them done in uh, Europe, in Flanders, in the Netherlands, what is today the Netherlands, uh, the Ghent altarpiece by Jan van Eyck, and a painting by a man called Shen Zhu, who is, uh, dates from the late 15th century, uh, 1492, who worked uh, near Shanghai. Um, and the reason for this uh, contrast is uh, more or less what you see on the screen here. This is a wonderful um, work of contemporary art, 1978, it's not so contemporary, but it dates from the time when Chinese artists were responding to the introduction of uh, ideas of what art might be about uh, that came from essentially America and uh, Europe. And so you have this uh, very smart Chinese artist, Yongping Huang, who produces something called uh, pulp art history, or a history of Chinese painting washed alongside, uh, washed for two minutes alongside a history of um, European art, and a concise history of modern painting. So the mixture, as a, as a result of two minutes in the washing machine, is pulp. Uh, you, you, can, you, you find a sort of deadlocks that the two systems will not make sense, that they, to invoke the uh, title of this meeting, if not transgress one another, they interfere, they run interference. I'm using, I'm interpreting the notion transgression rather loosely here, that the two systems, the two systems of time, European systems of time and Chinese uh, systems of time, run interference on one another in such a way that you can't get there from here. You can't, uh, that's um, more or less the thrust of what I want to say. So consider these two works, Jan van Eyck's Ghent Altarpiece, 1432, in St. Barfos Cathedral in Ghent, and Shen Zhu's Night Vigil, which you see on the right-hand side, which is in the Palace Museum collection in uh, Taiwan. These works of art belong to radically different ways of telling time, yet the history of art tends to envelop them both as examples of its disciplinary concerns. What I mean is more or less what Craig Clunas, one of the leading uh, historians of Chinese art, has to say. He points out, written eloquently, about the marginalization of Chinese art within the discipline of art history as a whole. He points out that the idea of modernism and modernity has served to keep Chinese culture at not just a geographical, but a temporal distance. Like many cultures encountered during the period of European expansion, China's otherness, its difference, served to define it as backward. The temporal trajectories to which these distinct forms of what we have come to call art, because there's really nothing called art in China before the 19th century, no concept of art, even though precious objects had been valued for a very long time, collected and written about and so on, nothing quite corresponding to the Western notion of art had existed there. Um, so even the, though these different forms of time had existed for a long time, they, uh, I think, continue to irritate and disturb one another. So that like Wittgenstein's, well, this is a, an art historical joke, which I'm not going to, uh, <laughs> this is, 
the, the famous rabbit, rabbit duck image that you may have seen. If you look at one, you can't see the other. If you look at the other, you can't see the one. So that's really what I'm uh, drive, driving at. Chronicles, genealogies, theoretical discussions, poetic appreciations, sophisticated uh, criticism uh, have a venerable, Chinese, uh, 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 venerable traditions in China. But there was no equivalent for the chronological and evolutionary narrative that characterizes accounts of art in the European past. That is the idea of recounting the story of Chinese art as a progression never took place. China was not only far from Europe, considered uh, not, not far from a Europe that considered itself the fount of civilization, but at the end of the 19th century, it was also at the opposite pole from what was declared to be the or original point of the newly instituted Greenwich Mean Time. Now, you probably all know that the time that we now tend to call universal time is only agreed in 1884 at a Congress uh, in Washington, D.C necessitated by trying to keep the newly developed railroads on, on schedule. You had to be able to tell uh, what time a train would reach Chicago after it had left New York. You could do this with a telegraph. Both of these are technical, not technological inventions of the late 19th century. This form of telling time, developed by the rapidly industrializing capitalist economies of Europe and the United States, and to which the various forms of time developed by various cultures have been forcibly related during the era of colonialism, have become, has become the dominant so-called universal time system observed throughout the world today. If, art histories, <coughs> if the history of art's purview covers the globe in spatial terms, its dedication to European time has made it less successful with dealing with other forms of time. Now, we have, of course, histories of African art, histories of Chinese art, and so on and so forth. But these, uh, these histories tend to be more about space than about time. So I want to call attention to what's lost when time is not taken into consideration. The temporal trajectories to which the works of art by Van Eyck and Shen Zhu belong will not leave one another alone. Any attempt to make one accessible to the historical uh, stories told about the other is bedeviled by problems of translation. Rather than being susceptible to reduction to a single form of time, art history's objects often belong to distinct shapes of time that impinge on one another's most deeply naturalized assumptions. One of the ironies of the moment is that the discipline's current obsession with world or global art history is that the search for universality has become almost more important than the definition of difference. And I'm not here, uh, Karen's paper touched on the uh, work of uh, art historians who are tracing the um, movement of works across the globe long before uh, modernization ever came on the uh, horizon. What I'm talking about is uh, art historians who are seeking solutions, universal solutions, to the problem that confronts them how to deal with these radically different cultures, how to put these radical, radically different cultures alongside each other. And, I, and my argument is rather reductively suggesting that they all belong to the same general temporal framework. Okay, so world art studies um, has, uh, ra rather than emphasize differences, world art studies uh, seem to be condemned to rehearse the power differentials existing between the time zones that are the consequence of colonialism and its accompanying economic exploitation. The dominant system, that is, overwrites the subtle but meaningful cultural differences that inform the organization and characterization of time's passage in different locations, thereby installing a temporal hierarchy that continues to inform the art historical studies to this day. Uh, art, art history departments are still coming to terms with the need to have uh, different parts of the globe represented on their faculties, and um, uh, there's this still uh, a, radically, a radical imbalance between the amount of attention that's paid to Europe and the United States rather than to other, other cultures uh, in the globe. Dis dismissing temporal considerations as culture uh, in quotes, leading theorists search for human coordinates that underlie all visual productions. 
Let me give you a couple of examples before moving on to try to compare and contrast what you see on the screens. In his book, Real Spaces, for example, David Summers explicitly bases his argument on the spatial organization of the human body. Here I quote him, what I should call the cardinal structure of the human body, its normative uprightness, symmetry, um, and facing is reiterated in much the basic and assumed meanings we take as given in the world around us. Now, what does that mean? It means that because we stand upright, because we have right and left, up and down, front and back, you can use these coordinates as a means of dealing with art of all times and places. Uh, space, naturalized as something called real metaphor, and thus second nature rather than time, is the condition of possibility for the creation of all art. Whitney Davis, on the other hand, offers us a neurological account of the process by which vision becomes social and cultural visuality. What he calls visuality is the cultural form of vision. That is, what we see is pushed into shape by the nature of the cultures in which we happen to be born. This cognitive development is allegedly common to all humans, so that even if time and place register in the outcome, potential cultural differences are not the focus of his investigation. Still looking for the universal coordinates that might account for the production of something called art. And then finally, uh, and most problematically perhaps, there is John O'Neill's, who argues that experience determines the way in which the neural potential, our neural potential, develops artistically. While the role of time and place are considered, the thrust of the argument is that the structure of the human brain, rather than cultural variety, is responsible for the nature of artistic production. So <clears throat> I'll spare you. There are a couple of other examples that I have here, but I'll, I'll spare you these because you get the thrust. That the idea that the problem uh, that confronts the global art history is actually trying to find some sort of universal panacea with which to account for all of this massive difference that actually confronts us. Uh, okay, one of the most um, thoughtful of the commentators on the idea of the possibility of a global art history is James Elkins. And uh, he actually has uh, called together conferences and written a book called Is Art History Global? Question mark, and invited uh, people from a variety of different perspectives to contribute to this enterprise. One of, um, he, he, uh, he comes to the conclusion that um, art history is necessarily uh, a European-based discipline, that, you, that there's no getting away from the fact that this is, if it's going to be called art history, it has to be informed by European values. And by that, more often, uh, mo most of the time, he seems to mean that the temporal frame of art history has to remain a European one. That, that is the gauge, that's going to be the measure by which all of these cultures are assessed. Uh, he tests this theory about the essentially Western nature of art history in a remarkable book entitled Chinese Landscape Painting as Western Art History. Now, there are all sorts of ironies embedded in the title, of course, but here he assesses the way in which European periodization has been used to frame Chinese art. Despite some remarkable parallels between Chinese developments and those that characterize European history, he concludes that the comparisons themselves betray the Western identity of those who make them. One of the few historians who has recognized the drawbacks of applying European temporal models to historical writing to Asian materials is John Clark. John Clark is an Australian uh, art historian who's written extensively on China, Japan, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, and so forth. Writing about modernism and postmodern art in Japan, China, and so on, he refuses to label these traditions as belated simply because they draw inspiration from what he calls the Euro-American artistic developments. So he's interested in modernism. All of these countries have taken on board the models of European and American art history. But, he argues, their modernisms do not coincide with what we call um, European modernism, that they have an identity of their own and that they, are inflect, they inflect the traditions. Uh, for example, the Chinese um, in, the, uh, in the image I showed you right on, this, this, at, at this particular moment, the 80s in China, uh, I think that um, Andy Warhol was probably better known than Picasso. Uh, 
Anyway, so the uh, Western initiatives are taken and transformed into all sorts of in, in interesting ways. He argues that, um, that the Euro European modernism was inflected differently according to the social and political circumstances of non-European cultures. While it is impossible to say what the art of these nations might have looked like without the encounter with Euro-American art, the results, the varied results, bear testimony to the varieties of their reception. Now, let me get back to the works of art that I want to talk about. Okay, here's the Gandalf piece. <coughs> um, and can we assign Jan van Eyck and Shen Zhu Can we assign these, <coughs> these um, artists to the same temporal scheme? Can we do justice to their work in terms of what we currently call history? Or must our idea of history be adjusted to recognize that they belong to different systems of telling time? Shen Zhu lived <coughs> in South China. This, this painting, this typical Chinese painting, has both uh, an inscription on it and this landscape. Uh, this is um, a, very common, uh, to, a very common practice. Shen Zhu lived in South China near, uh, near Shanghai in the late 15th century. Born into a family of landowners, Shen belonged to a class of gentleman scholars who painted for each other as well as for other wealthy patrons. Like many of his class, he dedicated himself to painting, calligraphy, and poetry as much for their prestige as aristocratic pursuits as for economic gain. His picture, Nine Vi Night Vigil of 1492, a hanging scroll painted in ink and light color on paper. It depicts a landscape accompanied by this long calli calligraphic inscription or colophon. The hanging scroll epitomizes an equation of painting and calligraphy, linguistic and pictorial media united by brush and ink. Far from competing with one another, as is so often the case with European tradition, uh, writing and painting here sh share a number of qualities. Not only are they executed using the same brush and ink materials, but they, have the, they share the same paper support. Wu Hung, one of the greatest uh, historians of Chinese art of our time, uh, eloquently describes the double-sided potential of the hanging scroll as a screen. And here I quote him, the screen destroys any sense of pictorial illusion, but re-establishes the materiality of the medium and redefines the concept of the surface. In other words, instead of erasing the surface, it's, the images confirm, confirm its existence. I hope this is plain. What he means is that the Chinese did, did not indulge in trying to fool the eye. It's no attempt, no attempt at so-called naturalism or realism, one-point perspective or anything like that. What you see is what you get. You get a, a painting, painting and writing that have more or less uh, have the same materials, and the surface is right there. There's no mistaking the surface for. Uh, there's no illusion here. You're often no illusion. Even if their factor is indebted to different linguistic and pictorial traditions, they share the same surface and are meant to be read simultaneously. Hanging scrolls belong to a world of enlightened, sophisticated social contemplation that had its own form of time. Clunas argues, here I quote him again, when they are seen, <coughs> when they are seen is just as important as what they depicted. Certain subjects were appropriate to certain seasons of the year, certain holidays, birthdays, if you moved house, uh, it would be important to have your, your hanging scrolls taken out or shown or rolled up and put away. When shown, they would be brought out before company by servants who unrolled them to be seen and then rolled them up again to be stored. Uh, Clunas quotes Shen Zhu's famous uh, pupil, Wen Zheng Ming, uh, perhaps one of the greatest Chinese artists of the Ming dynasty, a uh, little later than him, 15th, 16th century. Here is the pupil of the man whom we see on the screen. Whenever I visited him, I would, I would always, always go with something from my collection. The master would examine it for the whole day and would also produce items that he owned to the best of his abilities. He would often come into his study bearing four scrolls, and when they had been unrolled, he would go in and change them for another four, untiring, even though we went through several complete changes. So this gives you something of the flavor in which this thing was created and what its purpose might have been. <clears throat> 
Landscapes play an important role in Chinese uh, artistic production since the Han Dynasty, since about 200 BC to 220 AD. Uh, for the, uh, and for the, the indigenous religions of Taoism and Confucianism uh, emphasize a spiritual uh, identification with the natural forces of the universe. In other words, the role of landscape in Chinese painting has a lot to do with these religions that I've just mentioned, Taoism and Confucianism, because rather than be dedicated to the worship of divine entities, they, it is the natural forces of the universe that are of interest. It is the, the Tao, for example, the way, is trying to put your own life in consonance with the forces, the natural forces that uh, uh, run through us all, that actually dictate the, um, the shape of the universe, I mean, for, <laughs> for, for that matter. Um, so you have to think of religion that has nothing to do with deities. It's not until uh, Buddhism comes to China in the fourth to the sixth century AD that you get, uh, and, and of course when the Buddha never thought of himself as a god, he only was deified uh, later on as time went on. So this tradition is founded with these, um, this concept of natural forces being very lively and being part of uh, human life as well as the life that surrounds us. Um, in fact, Buddhism <coughs> um, confirmed the value of landscape as an important source of meditation. Pictures of landscape were in considered just as stimulating to philosophical thought as views of the landscape itself. And retiring to monasteries in the mountains, making pilgrimages to the tops of mountains and so on, figure very much in the Buddhist tradition as they do in these other traditions that I've mentioned already. Okay, back to night vigil. Shenzhou's night vigil is a very special landscape because uh, the artist meant it to record a particular moment in his own life. The inscription tells us that on not being able to sleep, Shen stayed awake in the dark, acutely aware of the objects and, and sounds that surrounded him. The night had been a rainy one, but the moon cast a dim light over the interior in which he sat. Sights and sounds acquired an unaccustomed significance, striking his ear and eye all at once, lucidly and wonderfully becoming part of me. Lucidly and wonderfully becoming part of me. He writes, <coughs> sounds are cut off, colors obliterated, but my will absorbing these alone endures. What is the so-called will? Is it inside me, after all, or outside? Must there be a way to decide this? How great is the power of sitting up at night? One should purify his heart and sit alone by the light of a newly trimmed bright candle. Through this practice, one can pursue the principles that underlie events and things, and the subtlest working of one's own mind as the basis for self-cultivation and response to external things. Through this, we will surely attain understanding. So it's a meditation. He's up all night, but it tends, it tends it to uh, a thoughtfulness on the nation of uh, human interactions with the universe, the, in, you, the, the things that surround us, and what is the will, he asks, for example. Shinzo's contemplation intimates a Taoist belief that humans are embedded in the world of nature and that philosophical truth is to be found in experience. It also betrays a depth, depth to confusion ethic of self-cultivation. You can improve yourself. There's an ethical dimension to this observation. His perception is not just description. It's meant to be sort of ele elevating and educational. Well, his painted landscape <coughs> refers to the moment he describes. It shows him seated. I don't know if you can see this. If I had a pointer, I would point it out. But if you look at the center, can you all see at the center of this uh, rather large landscape, there are a sort of group of small houses. In the one at the very center, you'll find somebody sitting cross-legged on a little um, stool of some kind. Is that, can you all make this out? You know, make, okay. Okay. Um, seated among the pines, placed in a mountain valley that belies the sounds of dogs and official... In other words, he, he mentions sounds of dogs and so on, as well as these uh, other things that I've mentioned. So this, in other words, means it probably wasn't done in Shuzhou that he lived, it was not in this town near Shanghai. Uh, in other words, or rather, it makes it probable that it was done in an urban environment rather than in a landscape. 
what I'm getting at here is that the landscape bears more relation to tradition than it does to observation. This is not a perception that you're looking at. This is not the product of the long study of the landscape. This is something that has long, traditional, uh, long traditions behind it. Um, in other words, there's a thoroughly conventional nature of the picture which follows the landscape formula of his Yuan dynasty predecessors such as Wang Meng and Nit San. Listen, I'm not an expert on Chinese painting. I can assure you that. I've had to learn quite a lot in the last month or two, uh, but it is a fascinating tradition. This is built on formulae. Nevertheless, a comparison of texts and images invites us to meditate on what we as viewers perceive and feel before this scroll. The little bridge in the foreground that leads us into, uh, I don't know whether you can see this either. Uh, let's see. Okay, um, the little bridge in the foreground leads down to the valley at the center of the uh, painting where the painting sits ensconced in his um, house looking out at the view. We are asked to focus on the seated figure rather than any other aspect of the scene. And the invitation strengthens and renders more immediate the feelings recorded in the text. The immediacy, the all at oneness of visual perception adds power to the more laconic and drawn out rendition of his thoughts recorded in calligraphy. Acknowledging that Shen's, uh, Shen's work is essentially an art historical painting based on earlier artists, Cahill, uh, another of the great Chinese art historians, uh, suggests that the concept of copying in Chinese painting constitutes a form of reverence for the past and that each painter inherits, and here I quote him, inherits the cumulative resources of all that have led up to his own point in the development. In other words, there's nothing wrong with copying. In copying, we as um, Euro European Americans tend to think that this is a bad word, especially in the shadow of modernism. What could be worse than an artist who copies other people? Here it's a value. This is a value. To participate in this tradition is thought to be something wonderful. Uh, employing the uh, uh, fabric metaphor, Cahill continues, each such imitation then stands out not only on the same warp line as its contemporaries, the period style of art historians, but also on the woof strand extending back through a linked series to the creator of that particular lineage. Okay, what I'm trying to get at is that if you have paintings, a painting tradition that uh, is so much uh, indebted to the past, then it's very difficult to give it a, chron a place in chronological time. These paintings see seem to defy chronological time. You can't locate them well. And you might think of it in terms of performative and substitutional, which have become uh, concepts that were developed by uh, two, uh, in a recent book called Anachronic Renaissance, in which uh, these artists, Alexander Nagel, Nagel and Christopher Wood, um, developed uh, one uh, as performative paintings were pa paintings that, that called attention to themselves and substitutional paintings would be paintings that do not call attention to themselves, whose value lies in their repetition. Well, the value of this would lie in the fact that it invokes such uh, well-regarded, well such um, illustrious um, traditions. Okay, um, and here again is, is Cahill. And this is, I'm using his words really to try to get at what, uh, what I want to say. The difficulty of reconciling these individual linked series of work with broader chronological developments of determining, that is, the precise art historical coordinates of a given work is part of what makes the history of later Chinese painting so resistant to conventional art historical formulation. So resistant to conventional art historical formulation. Cahill points, uh, <coughs> Cahill's point that the relation between uh, copied works betrays a different temporal rhythm to that of the chronological pas passage of time is one I want to emphasize in comparing Shen's picture with that of Van Eyck. Shen's picture may very well be called art historical. After all, it depends on quoting the past in its citation of earlier artists. But at the same time, it is anti-art historical painting in refusing to fit easily within the period style assigned to it 
by its chronological location. In other words, it seems to step outside, deliberately step outside of what we call um, history. In other words, steps outside of chronology. The archaisms of Chinese paintings defy the temporal system of European art history by failing to re reveal the historical moment to which they belong. To what time does Shen's work belong? Clunas emphasizes that Ming conception, Ming being the dynasty to which he belongs, uh, conceptions of time were not teleological. Uh, here I quote him, it, time, had no single point of origin, like the creation of the world, the incarnation of Christ, or the Hiraj, or Hejira, namely the date when Muhammad fled Mecca for Medina. These are points in which Islamic history has a source, in which Christian history has a source, Christian history has a source, a beginning, a middle, and an end. This is nothing, there's nothing like that in the Chinese tradition. Um, <clears throat> okay. Since years were counted from the beginning of a dynasty, time was political rather than sacral. If it had a past, it had no future, there was no telling when uh, or if the dynasty would end. Within the official time system, there were, of course, other ways of calculating time, one of them being the division of the hours of the day and night, marking the hours, for example, permitted the Shen to hear the drum and bell uh, during his wakeful night. So they were, they were telling time, there were uh, moments in the night and day that were marked, but there was no idea of time moving somewhere. The time was not uh, a developmental, evolutionary, whatever you want to call it. So then, how can we compare the time of Shen's painting with that of Jan van Eyck's Ghent altarpiece? Can the same idea of history usefully be applied to the understanding of both of these works that seem at least synchronically related? Eyck's work is intimately embedded in Christian time. As a liturgical and devotional aid, the painting is located in a side chapel of St. Barbara Cathedral, where it stands above an altar. Closed during much of the year, but open during feast days, the outer wings represent the Annunciation, which depict the beginning of the Christian story, namely the Incarnation. This Christ's coming to earth is embedded in the story of the Incarnation. The, incarna the, the announcement to the Virgin of his impending birth is prefigured by prophecies of the Old Testament seers, Zacharias and Micah, who uh, you can find at the top looking down with scrolls above their heads, which so the Old Testament used by Christian authors in order to emphasize that this is the savior of humanity. When you open the uh, altarpiece re reveals at the bottom the so-called worship of the Lamb. Worship of the Lamb, this is at the center of paradise, uh, and the heavenly host has uh, uh, surrounded the Lamb in order to pay it uh, uh, homage. This apocalyptic iconography makes use of the Passover lamb that led to the salvation of the Jews from the Egyptians as an allegory of Christ's sacrifice for humanity. The lamb that symbolizes Christ, maybe I have a detail of this. The lamb that, that symbolizes Christ's sacrifice um, bleeds into a chalice akin to that used to contain the wine during the Eucharist. It is thus another reference to Christ's sacrifice. The fountain below refers to the four rivers of, sac of, of paradise, which were symbols of the salvation promised by the New Testament. Liturgical practice dating from the 13th century onwards ensured that the officiating priest would have raised the bread wafer as he, uh, in front of the altar, symbol of Christ's flesh for the devout worshippers for all to see. In other words, the wafer uh, used as a symbol of Christ's flesh would have been held aloft in front of the Lamb standing on the altar. Paradisical time, the time of the worship of the Lamb, is mystically related to human time by means of the recurring memorial of Christ's sacrifice cele celebrated daily in the Eucharist. So we have, um, Ike's work is essentially a time machine, one that relates Christian theology with its promise of salvation to the everyday rituals of the Christian church. Fifteen foot high wooden boards were cobbled together Uh, <coughs> cobbled together uh, to, uh, to, and offer, to offer a surface for the oil paintings. The scale and quality of these materials, together with the illusionistic style of the paintings, this is, if there was ever naturalism, this could be it, could be defined as naturalism, or naturalism could be defined in terms of this painting, 
foster a spatial illusion for those participating in the reenactment of Christ's death and resurrection. Christ's, uh, Ike's altarpiece was associated with public displays of devotions. Shen's landscape belongs to a privileged world of sophisticated cont contemplation. One disguises the artifice of its facture in the interests of its religious function, using its unparalleled mastery of mimesis to render the invisible visible. The other demands attention to be paid to the means by which it was made in an unabashed assertion of its status as an aesthetic object. Shen's insists that this is an aesthetic object that to be valued as such. It's not to be valued because it represents any particular deity, not to be uh, valued because it, re does it represents an emperor. It's not in the service of the state. It's not in the service of religion. It is an aesthetic object, something that you know, uh, Western Europe had to wait for probably the, the, uh, 19th, the 18th or 19th century. To him. European periodization system, the scaffolding that supports the idea that time is progressive, is often an embarrassment to its own narrative. The work of Van Eyck, for example, is characterized as either late medieval or northern renaissance. What, what might these concepts be? The former late, uh, late medieval, the Middle Ages, is capacious but fairly meaningless term caught between, as it is, between something and something else. The middle of what? Uh, it depends on the idea that the revival of ancient culture of Greek and Roman uh, art took place in Italy in the 14th century. The fact that this revival has no equivalent in Northern Europe until the 16th century makes it all the stranger to be associated with the work of Van Eyck. It's not, it's, it is only his persuasive realism that enables him to be identified as an, as an artist of a period that Jakob Burckhardt, one of the great founding art historians of the late 19th century, famously described as turning towards the observation of the world after the long night of Christian piety. Now, you know, when you look at Van Eyck, it's dedicated, nothing could be more Christian or nothing more, could be more pious than something like this, and yet somehow realism comes about. Where does this realism come from? This, uh, Eyck is hardly uh, aware of the Greco-Roman revival that was taking place in Italy, so it's just um, somehow a subterranean uh, force that uh, Burkhardt is anxious. Uh, I mean, this realism, this naturalism, is uh, what allows um, the uh, profession, my profession, art historians, to call this uh, a northern renaissance work. Applying the idea of the renaissance to the archaeism of Shenzhou, um, also, let's see if I have some, no. Applying the idea of the Renaissance to the, the archaism of Shenzhou also misses the mark. If Song and Yuan dynasty painting was the high point of, of uh, his inspiration, its effect on latest artists represent, uh, represents continuity rather than a break with the past. It seems wiser, therefore, to accept the differences between the European and Chinese traditions rather than their similarities. Shenzhou's self-consciousness about his experience and the creation of his painting bears little relation to the art, uh, the nature of um, the, uh, the world that artists uh, inhabiting the European courts of the late 15th and 16th century uh, were in. Whereas European artists were in the surface of state, religion, and the rising capitalist bourgeoisie, this, and their subject matter determined by Christian dogma and the occasional portrait, Chinese artists belonged to a class that was free to paint what would satisfy not only their patrons, but most significantly, themselves. Can the term history, in quotes, be freed from its evolutionary freight so as to deal with other ways of experiencing the past? Might art history be rethought so as to accommodate or at least recognize the multiple natures of non-European forms of temporality? Can it absorb the idea that time might be multiple rather, without losing its identity? Perhaps not. Time is, after all, invisible, and therefore subject uh, only to arbitrary forms of determination. It can only be rendered accessible by transposition into language or other systems of measurement, and the difficulties presented by translation are all too familiar. Furthermore, the very enterprise of translating the past into the present is bound to invest it with significance um, it never had before and which it can never have again. In other words, history is always written in the present. What then is to be gained from attempting to understand the non-European along with the European past? And I'm not sure I have an answer. <coughs> um, contrasting the 
uh, let's just let's go back to the problem. The problem might as well serve as the conclusion. Contrasting temporal cultures must inevitably be undertaken from yet another moment in time, that of the interpreting historian. The value of such juxtaposition lies in revealing the provinciality of accepted narratives of the past. The nature religions of the Chinese, for example, remind us of the curiously individualistic character of the Christian faith, with its emphasis on salvation. While the equation of human nature with cosmic forces elides the subject-object distinction in ways that are unimaginable to Europe, the European imagination. The European concept of history, however, belongs to a narrative that has become second nature to art history, and the role it plays in cross-cultural comparisons is not often recognized. We have histories, in quotes, of many cultures, but the fact that they're all told from the same European perspective often goes unnoticed. Given the economic and cultural power of the dominant form of universal time, it is no surprise that its contingency in the face of cultural difference is overlooked. The drive to theorize the rapidly expanding parameters of art history in terms of, of the structure of human nature, or even the brain, to look beneath cultural discrepancies for some eternal constant misses the narrative power of temporal heterogeneity. The talk, this talk, then, is not a call for the abandonment of chronology or even of approaching the past with evolutionary attitudes, so much as a plea for the recognition of time's complexity as well as of its mystical and poetic potential. Thank you.